I have to say this is the first time I've given a presentation and um, done it with a beer in my hand. So already this is probably the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> Besides marrying my wife. And the birth of my two children. And finding out I had a third one on the way. That was a little scary. Um, this past week, uh, on Sunday, we celebrated the feast of the baptism of the Lord. And in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, after the baptism of the Lord, it says that Jesus was driven out by the Spirit into the desert and um, to be tempted by the devil. Now, Mark... It's just one little paragraph. It says he was tempted and angels ministered to him, basically. Matthew and Luke go into the typical depictions that we're used to with um, Jesus being tempted to turn stones into bread, uh, throw himself down from a high mountain, and to worship Satan. The only difference is they changed the order a little bit in, in how those temptations were offered to Jesus. For tonight, I want to focus on Luke's account because it offers a bit of a context that I think is, appro is um, yeah, appropriate for our conversation this evening. It says in Luke's Gospel, The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me. And I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it shall all be yours. Now, there's so much here. We could probably spend a semester just breaking down all of the context and the implications of everything that is uh, in this short paragraph. But the focus that I want to take is where the devil says that all the authority and glory of the world had been delivered to him. My question is, who delivered it? Uh, God created the world, um, but it doesn't seem likely that God would hand over his creation to the devil to have authority over it. Um, we could initially propose an idea that um, every single kingdom individually handed over their authority to the devil. Um, and while that's plausible, um, not one exception? You know, I mean, even the... Uh, even the Jews had uh, put up idols in the temple to worship other gods. So that's, that's a plausible answer. But I think the, uh, if we look at Scripture in its um, whole context, we can find a better answer. In Genesis 1, God creates man and woman and gives them dominion over all the earth. So when God created the world, he handed over dominion to man and woman. So if the devil ended up with it, they gave it to him. And so now we're in a situation where the devil has now taken control of the world through a man and woman giving it over to them. And the devil is trying to use it as a, as a, um, a bargaining chip, if you will. But that's not the end of the story. At the end of the gospel, as Jesus is ascending into heaven, he says, all authority has been given to me. Uh, and then later Paul tells the Ephesians that God made Jesus to sit at his right hand and he has put all things under his feet and made him head of all things. So Jesus now has authority over the world. How did he get it? He suffered and died on the cross, which Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 is a nuptial act. Christ, through the action of the cross, became the husband of the world, of the church, I should say, rather. And it's through that act, he now takes back authority over the, 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 of creation. And so it is through the nuptial act redeemed that authority is now back returned to its rightful place and taken from Satan. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, tonight as we talk about the domestic church, what I want to argue tonight is that 
domestic church is not a cliche or a new marketing scheme that the church has adopted to try to like get people excited about marriage again. All right. Domestic church has its, the, the concept of the domestic church has its roots all the way into the Old Testament, into the New Testament, the church fathers, the Second Vatican Council, and in the teaching of John Paul II himself. And so we're going to do a quick survey and we're going to look at three different things. We're going to try to see if the family is a true domestic church, a true small church. It's going to, it's going to have an ecclesial nature. It's going to be like the church's nature itself. It's going to have an ecclesial um, uh, structure. It's going to be organized like the church is organized. And it's going to have an ecclesial mission. So whatever the, the mission of the church is, the family will have the, a similar mission. And so, without further ado, I'm going to jump into the ecclesial nature of the church. <laughs> For the Jews, it was the family's task to carry on the covenant. It wasn't the task of an institution or a specialized evangelist or um, teacher. It was the family's task. And so in the family, it's teachings, rituals, especially it's blessings. Through these things, it passed on the covenant from one generation to the next. You know, we see this uh, most, um, especially in the story of Jacob and Esau, how Jacob comes in and he steals the blessing from Esau. And Esau is, is rightfully angry about that. Why? Because it is through the one of the, that has the blessing that the, the covenant continues to pass on. And so Jacob steals that from him. But not only all of this, a person's identity for the Jew uh, was rarely seen um, exclusively individually. It took up the whole gamut of relationships, fathers, mothers, cousins, um, sons, but even more than that, ancestors. Excuse me. So this is, the, the family relationships were so important to the mindset of the Jewish person. This is why genealogies abound in the Old Testament. Um, if you're ever feeling bored, open up First Chronicles and read the first nine chapters, and then you'll realize you weren't really bored. <laughs> now you are. <laughs> Literally all nine chapters is one long genealogy. So. But the genealogies were important because it situated the individual within his tribe, his nation, his people. And um, in our day and age, we've kind of lost this a bit. We see the family as father, mother, son, and daughter. Uh, grandparents, maybe some cousins and, and uncles and aunts. But really, when we talk about the family, we're talking about that core um, Carl Zimmerman, in a text, uh, he's a sociologist, he, I, th I forget when he did the study, but um, he called the difference between the trustee family that has these extended relationships and then the atomistic family, just the, the uh, father, mother, son, and daughter. Um, and so these families, they, they, they understood their family to be in a larger sense than just the small, um, small, uh, Adamistic family. Um, but even more than that, they had this idea of the corporate personality. This is something that we, we have completely left behind. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to try to explain this. Um, the corporate personality was like an organic dimension that united all of the family members. They didn't so much see the soul as an individual instantiation that you had, there was kind of like a shared soul, but also the individual. So um, the, the mix between the one and the many. Um, an example of this is that they, uh, it's like a common consciousness or a common personality that all the members participate in. Um, if you think about when, the, when they would talk about their patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they saw the depictions of these men not as just descriptions of a historical figure, but also describing themselves. 
because they were in that um, historical figure. The nation of Israel was in Abraham when he made the covenant uh, with God. The nation of Israel was in Jacob uh, when he was renamed uh, Israel by God. And so the whole nation could be call itself Israel because the whole nation was in him when his name was changed. And so, um, in a certain sense, all of humanity was in Adam, even Eve, him, Eve herself. <coughs> i got to remember to switch the slide. Um, this is why when Eve is taken out of Adam, Adam says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she has the same commands to, uh, uh, and functions that Adam was given, not to eat of the tree. John Paul II takes this understanding uh, in his theology of the body, and he looks at the experiences that Adam has before the fall and applies them to all of us, because in a certain sense, we all were present in the first man. And so, um, and so this, this sense that I am my own individual, but I'm also uh, connected to all, everyone around me, uh, pervaded the culture. Uh, we have a little bit of a sense of this when we talk about the, you know, when we, when we look at scripture and we see types in the scriptures. Um, we'll look and we'll see Bathsheba, uh, uh, Sarah, and Eve as types of Mary to come. You know, Bathsheba was the queen mother like Mary. Sarah had an impossible pregnancy, and Eve was the mother of all the living. All those things are in Mary. But, for, but we've kind of flipped it with, with the new covenant. We've come to see that rather than everything only being in the ancestor, everything also found its capitulation in Jesus and in the new covenant. And so all those figures, Moses and Abraham, they're, they, they find their fulfillment. They're living out the life of Jesus um, rather than it being flipped the other way around. Another depiction of this is... Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, when the holy innocents are slaughtered, and the text says, A voice was heard in Rama, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. So, who are the mothers weeping for the loss of the children? They all are Rachel. They've been identified with her, they're living out her sorrow and her pain in this moment. And not in a merely poetic sense. They're sharing in the life principle of which Rachel is the primary figure. Um, another way in which this gets lived out, the corporate personality, is um, the Hebrew sense of punishment and blessing. So in, uh, in one sense, we're all born of Adam. And so we're all born into the sin of Adam. You know, uh, when you teach young children that they're born with sin because, they're, because of original sin in Adam, there's always a sense of like, well, that's not fair. I didn't do anything wrong. But to a, a Hebrew child, that wouldn't have been an issue because they had this larger sense of like, I am part of what Adam did. So, in the book of Joshua, Achan steals... Um, some of the some items that were meant to be devoted to God. And the next day, the army is sent out to deal with a small marauding band. And so they're like, eh, we'll just send out a few thousand, we'll wipe them up, and we'll be, we'll be back before dinner. Well, they get routed. And Joshua goes to God and throws himself down like, Lord, I thought you were on our side. Why are you not fighting for us? And the Lord says, he says, Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. So God is acting as if the whole nation has violated that principle and has participated in the stealing of, of those items. Um, not just Achan, but the whole nation. So when it is found out that Achan is the perpetrator, of course, he's punished. But not just Achan himself. Since he was the head of his household, 
his sons, his daughters, his uh, oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, even his tent is brought out and stoned because they're all guilty of the sin. So um, I think I've made my point that uh, there's a, a, a sense that there is a, a spiritual connection that goes deeper than just DNA, just the very fact that we share the last name. There's something connecting me to my ancestors and to my tribe and to my nation that goes a little bit deeper than biology. So let's set that down and we'll move on. In the Garden of Eden, um, there's two creation stories. I don't know, a lot of times people aren't familiar, are aware of that. There's actually two creation stories. The first creation story is called the Eloist uh, um, creation story. Uh, and it is named that because the name used for God, this is Genesis chapter 1, the name used for God in that uh, chapter is Elohim. And it depicts God as more of a cosmic figure, uh, just saying, let there be light, and there's light. And he's ordering the different elements of creation and setting things up. And the, the picture we get of God is this absolute power and wisdom and strength. In the second chapter of Genesis, we have the um, Yahwist account, because the name for God in that is Yahweh. And it takes on more of a personal, intimate account. God is shown as walking with Adam through the garden, breathing into his nostrils life. And so you have these two depictions of, of God, but yet in each depiction, Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI, he wrote a, um, a small book commenting on, um, on Genesis, and, and he says that in each of these uh, creation stories, we see that the meaning and purpose of creation is the worship of God. And so through the right ordering of creation, um, man returns back in, in worship of, the, of God. So um, part of that is the description of the garden that we get. Sometimes you'll be reading, you know, at least for me, I'll be reading through Genesis uh, 2 and you know, creation of Adam, and then it gets to like, and then Bedellium and, and Jasper, and like it starts naming the stones and like where the rivers were running to. And I go, okay, jump a couple of verses down, let's get back into the story. That is actually a very important part because what, what the author of Genesis is doing there is he's making connections to the temple. Um, the, the depiction of, in, in Ezekiel of the temple is that there's water running out the right side of the temple and it flows out into the world and it makes the, the, the waters of the world fresh again. Well, in Genesis, we have the water, that it, the river in Genesis flows out into Egypt and Cush and all these lands, giving them life. Um, the menorah that was in the temple was meant to be a kind of tree of life the temple was decorated with images of trees and flowers and birds. All of this was meant to make a connection between the Garden of Eden and the temple. Um, in addition to that, Adam is given the, ta he's given the job uh, to till and guard the, uh, the garden. Now, the, the Hebrew words used there are obdah and shomra. Okay, and those two words, when they're used together in the Old Testament, they're only ever used in this cultic sense of worship. So it was the job of the priest to do obda and shomra in, in the temple. When, when, uh, when Moses uh, is meeting God uh, on Mount Sinai and God tells him to come back with the people and do, do worship, he, he tells uh, Moses to do uh, this obda, or a form of the word. Um, and so Adam is, is really like a, the high priest in the garden, meant to offer worship to God. And so the fact that w right within that story, we have the creation of Eve and the marriage of the two, and then the command to be fruitful and multiply, there's a very um, unaccidental connection between the family and the worship that is done in the temple. Um, in fact, let me see where did I put that. Oh yeah, uh, the in the writings of the rabbis, they called the family the miskan katan, the little sanctuary, 
because it was seen that the, in the family is where the, the, the center of Hebrew cultic worship took place. Um, and so we see that in, uh, originally God set up the, uh, the family as the center of the, of the carrier of the covenant through its blessings, promises, through this idea of the sense of the corporate soul passed on from one generation to another, the, the, the covenant, um, the connection with the Garden of Eden and the temple, um, but even in the, like the, the Passover sacrifice. Part of the ritual of the Passover is that the youngest in the family steps up and says, why do we do this? And the head of the, the household basically recounts Exodus. And it's the recounting and the Passover ritual isn't just merely kind of like, oh yeah, they did that a long time ago, so we're going to do it kind of remembering it. Because of this idea of the corporate soul, everybody participating in the, the, um, the Passover meal at any point in time is going back to that first Passover meal because they were present in their ancestors. And so they're, they, the um, Passover has this sense of remembrance that you, call, you, you make present the original event. Now that's actually what we, we understand that happens in the Mass. That we, when we go to Mass, it's not just a redoing of, of the Last Supper or the uh, Mount Calvary. We're making present the original event as it was. So, uh, one last thing to say about the Old Testament. I know I'm kind of stretching this out, but it's going to have connections later on. Uh, there was a common priesthood in the Old Testament. Every father of every household was meant to be a priest, offering sacrifice. Um, this changed after that famous sin. I remembered I got to do some more of this. Uh, this changed after that famous sin at Mount Sinai where they worshiped the golden calf. Um, God took away the priesthood from the family and he gave it to the tribe of Levi because they were the faithful tribe. Now, in, throughout, the old, uh, throughout Genesis, we see the heads of the household offering sacrifice. Noah offers sacrifice. Um, Abraham offers sacrifice. Jacob offers sacrifice. They're all offering sacrifice. They're not like specialized, ordained priest. They're, um, they're participating in the common priesthood that was given by God to the whole, to the whole nation. So, moving on. New Testament. Now, uh, the, the thing that um, is interesting about the New Testament is that when the people that were the first church, they didn't see themselves as different from the Jews. They were just kind of the next line of development. And so they would go to synagogue or temple on Saturday, and then they would go and have mass on Sunday. And um, they saw themselves as a continuation of everything that was happening for the Hebrew people. And so they begin the Gospel of Matthew and um, also in the Gospel of Luke with a genealogy. But it's the last genealogy we ever get in the Bible because it's the genealogy of Jesus. And so the, the corporate soul has now seen its fulfillment in him. Everything that comes from Jesus and everything that was before Jesus is, is aiming to, it has him at the central point. And so when Jesus encounters Paul on the road to Emmaus, he doesn't say, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting the Christians? He says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Because to be a Christian meant to participate in the life of Jesus himself. And so each of us as baptized members of his body are living the corporate soul of Jesus Christ. We are living his life and holiness isn't a matter of whether or not you're obeying the commandments. Holiness is a matter of how much you've aligned yourself to Jesus Christ and how much you've allowed him to transform you and so that you can live his life within your own life. So the corporate soul you see now has been transformed by Jesus. And so when we go to communion at Mass, communion is a sign of what is already existing. We are his body. And so when we, we partake of his, his uh, flesh and blood at Mass, it's a sign of what is already existing. And we're living out that life. And so we see this, um, we see this as, uh, in the Catholic understanding of the uh, deposit. Um, uh, shoot, what is it? Sorry, I just blanked. The treasury of merit. 
we have this understanding that the saints, the, the, the communion of saints around the world, those in heaven, those in purgatory, we, you, you benefit. You know, when some elderly nun in Calcutta is doing her holy hour, it's benefiting me because she's, she's becoming a vehicle for grace for the entire world. And so I benefit from that. Um, so with, with Jesus, we see that there's no longer uh, a need for simply a biological descent from Abraham. It becomes a spiritual affinity. Um, and this happens because when you're, when you're baptized, you're reborn. And when, when Jesus says to Nicodemus, you know, uh, you must be born again, I'm, I, by implication, you're born into a family. There's no such thing as being born without being born into a family. And so we're born into this family of the church. Um, okay. I just jumped all over the place, so I had to find my, where I am in my notes. Okay, and then the interesting thing that then takes place in the Acts of the Apostles is five times we see baptisms of entire households. This is something that, as Catholics, we like to kind of put forward as the reason why we can baptize our infants. Um, some of our Protestant brothers and sisters make the claim that you can't baptize an infant because they haven't been able to demonstrate faith. But if we have this understanding of the corporate personality, then the child, through its mother and father, does have faith. And they're not just borrowing it from dad. The, the faith of mom and dad is the faith of the child. And so through that, the child is able to uh, receive the sacrament of baptism. Because faith always comes before baptism. It'll, it's, it's what allows you to receive the sacrament of bat baptism. And baptism isn't like, uh, is, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Often people think there is, but there's, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between baptism and circumcision. But in this, there was, it was analogous with the, with the Jews. Circumcision didn't bring you into the covenant. Circumcision kept you into the covenant. Uh, in Genesis, God says that if you are not circumcised, you're cast out from the covenant. Well, you can't be cast out if you're not in it. So what brought you into the covenant was your family relationship. And so just like as we do with our children now, the family relationship they have is the, what provides them the faith to be able to be baptized in the first place. So... Um, what brings you in is your family relationship. Uh, and that's because God designed the covenant to be carried through the family and to be passed on through the family. So uh, that's, in many ways, how the, the family has a, an, an ecclesial nature is because we're one body in the family. We share this nature uh, amongst the, 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 we share this relationship amongst the different members of the body. Um, and in the church, we also share the one, nature, the one nature of Jesus Christ. We share the relationship of being one body, one flesh, and, and who Jesus is then becomes the life that I need to live uh, to, to attain holiness. Hope that made sense. All right, now moving on to ecclesial structure. Now, I, I actually chose this picture because I don't know if you know Archbishop Sample, but he's like six foot five. And he likes to wear these tall miters, so then he ends up being like eight foot. Um, he's, he's an imposing figure. So, so, uh, so there's an ecclesial nature to the family. There's an ecclesial structure. Now, this is what um, actually St. Augustine and St. John Chrysostom, two of the church fathers, this is what they taught. And so St. Augustine, um, he, when he was writing letters to families, he you know, he would ask for their prayers and kind of encourage them to incorporate Christ into their family life. Um, but he teaches that the role and the function of the bishop is present within the ecclesial structure of the domestic church as well. So in the Gospel of, uh, of John, um, he, he, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, he says this to fathers. He says, On behalf of Christ and for eternal life, let the father of the family admonish, teach, exhort, rebuke, use benevolence, and exercise discipline for all who belong to him. In this fashion, in his own home, he will fulfill the ecclesial office, and in a certain sense, the episcopal office, ministering to Christ so that may, he may be with him in eternity. So, uh, some things that we can draw out here. Uh, 
fathers and, and mothers by implication have a particular job to teach, preach, admonish, and govern on behalf of Christ. They're taking the place of Christ within their families. That's what we say about the priest. In persona Christi means in the person of Christ. And so the, 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 the parents and the family take on that role to admonish and to rebuke. Uh, those are all tasks of the bishop. Typically, we say that the bishop has three offices. The office to teach, to govern, and to sanctify. Um, and here we see Augustine assigning those tasks of the bishop to the, the parents. The office to teach, he mentions that explicitly, but also the task, uh, he, he says, that imply governance, admonishing, exhorting, disciplining. And then through the task of ministering, Augustine is saying that parents have the task of sanctifying their children. Now, um, I originally thought that the task of the parents kind of ended at sanctifying. They had the job to teach, obviously, and the job to uh, uh, kind of exhort their children and to govern them. But it seemed like the, the job of sanctifying was kind of reserved to the bishops and the priests, right? And then I found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in paragraph nine, uh, 902, it says this, In a very special way, parents share in the office of sanctifying by leading a conjugal life in the Christian spirit and by seeing to the Christian education of their children. So parents also have this task of sanctifying their children in the way that they're, um, they're parenting them, more or less. So uh, finally, what, what Augustine points out is the father's role is not merely for the temporal and secular good of the family to make sure that they've got a house to live under and clothes to wear, but it's also for their eternal good as well. But that quote just wasn't one instance of what Augustine said. Uh, he also had this to say when he was preaching to, to, um, other, uh, to, to fathers, as, uh, actually. He says, Perform our office in your homes. A bishop is called uh, so because he supervises, because he has to watch over those in his care. So every one of you in his own house, if he's the head of the household, the function of bishop ought to apply to him. How his people believe seeing none of them drift, drift into heresy. Keep a very watchful eye over the welfare and salvation of all of your household. So this was kind of the practice and the, the position of St. Augustine that mothers and fathers were the bishops in their family. And they had the exact same task of, of teaching, governing, and sanctifying their family that the bishop had for the larger church. Now, St. John Chrysostom he was the bishop of Constantinople. He was renowned for his preaching. Actually, the word Chrysostom is actually a nickname. It means golden mouth. So after tonight, you can all start calling me golden mouth. I'm just kidding. Um, he said that uh, in, in homily 20, uh, to the, uh, on the, um, he's preaching on the letter of the Ephesians. He said that there should be two altars in the home. There should be an altar, one for, for meals, and then one for the sacred readings, and so that the family should put forth the effort to teach and learn the faith. And he exhorted parents, make your home a church to put the devil to flight. Um, for John Chrysostom, he doesn't speak as much as Augustine does on the nature of parents as being bishops, but on the task parents have to make their homes into churches. And so... He does this in, in two main ways. Um, the first are he, he speaks very much on how the scriptures are paramount and how the scriptures have to be the center of the home. He even says, like, when you're at home just relaxing, the Bible better be in your hand. Um, and so they need to be the center. There should be like a throne in the home for the scriptures. Um, but he also says that uh, when parents exercise their authority, they should do it as the bishop does in a servant way. This is the... the Christian method of authority is always meant for the other and not for one's own power and position. And so uh, through those, those two methods, he, he kind of exhorts parents as uh, means in which they can help make their, their own homes um, domestic churches. Um, he had one final thing to say. He said that the, the greatest good, the chief good in a home is for the husband and wife to be in agreement and at peace. So you can talk to your spouse about whether or not you're, you're achieving uh, John Chrysostom's goal here. But this was because Jesus said at the, at the Last Supper in John's Gospel that what he was praying for the church was 
that there be peace. Um, we recall that every time we go to Mass, you know, the peace not as the world gives, but as I give. Um, and so this should also be one of the things that husbands and wives are working at diligently as maintaining peace amongst themselves because that will redound to the rest of the family. Now, that being said about our two church fathers, the idea of the domestic church almost died. Um, there's really nothing about it for a thousand years. Um, the church uh, got kind of preoccupied with stopping heresy and dealing with the fall of the Roman Empire and um, you know the, the Borgia popes and, and the abuses and things like that that were going on, Protestant Reformation, you know, just little things. Um, but at the beginning of the 20th century, there became, a little bit before that, there became a revival in the theology and understanding of family life. Uh, one, of the first, one of the major documents was written in 1930 uh, by Pope Pius XI in response to the Anglican Church had just approved contraception. And so Pius XI wrote a beautiful document called Casti Canubii on the nature of the family. Um, but then onward into the, the 20th century, we get to the Second Vatican Council, and um, as they wrote the, the documents of the of Vatican Council, what they did is they had um, kind of drafting uh, committees that got together and wrote up the documents, and then bishops were able to kind of give their input. And well, what happened was the bishops got to Rome, and they threw out everything that had been prepared. And so there became this long process of, of rewriting these documents. And there was one document in particular, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church. It was called Lumen Gentium. And it was meant to be kind of a, um, to lay out the church's theology about herself. And one bishop from Italy got up. His name was Bishop Pietro Fiordelli. And he wanted to make the case that there should be a section on the family in the document on the church. And he was basically told to go sit back down because this is a document on the church, not the family. And they have no part to play in this. The family is de deals with the regular sphere of the world and we deal with the, the divine sphere. And so if it was outside of the, um, the realm of the clergy, it had no place to do in this document. Well, good old Bishop Pietro, he didn't take no for an answer. So he actually gave four different speeches making the case that this uh, should be the understanding of the church, um, that the, the family is actually a way to holiness and not just, uh, you know, kind of something on the side. And so um, he basically won the day. Uh, there's now a section in Lumen Gentium on the family, and Lumen Gentium actually called the family the domestic church. So it's actually now part of the theology of the church about the family is that it's the domestic church. And, um, he, you know, he did this through arguing that what I presented tonight about Augustine and, and Chrysostom. This is actually present in the, the early church. And so, um, and so he won the day. He the document included the family, but then he pushed it a little bit further. And he said, actually, husbands and wives are consecrated for their service through the sacrament of matrimony. Now, there had never been anything like that. Bishops are consecrated, but men and women are not consecrated in the family. Um, but now, if you were to open up the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says that through the sacrament of matrimony, husbands and wives are consecrated for their service to, the, to, to life and to um, the building up of the body of Christ. So, um, oh, it's also in canon law, too. So, he's a pretty good, guy. you know, he, whatever he was able to do, he, he talked a good talk. Um, and then finally, he argued that marriage is not just a, the realm of the secular, that it is a path of holiness, that um, the path of of ordination or consecrated life are not just the only paths to holiness, that marriage itself, because it's been or, uh, redeemed by Christ, and because Christ chose to uh, identify dying and rising on the cross with the nuptial act of, of husband and wife, that that uh, has um, designated marriage as, a, as the, uh, a way of holiness. So, I know I'm still on St. Augustine. Vatican II. Okay. So, ecclesial nature, ecclesial structure, now ecclesial mission. So, 
John Paul II, he takes what was done in Vatican II and kind of runs with it. Um, in a document, Familiaris Consortio, was, which was written in 1981, um, he pointed out that the family doesn't just get its identity from Christ, it also gets its mission. Now, he has a lot to say about what that mission is, but I'm going to focus in on one element of it. Um, he says, since the family gets its identity from Christ, the identity, Christ's identity is, is tied up, it's one with his mission. Who Christ is is also what Christ met, was, came to do. And so we talk about the three munera, or the three roles of Christ, as priest, prophet, and king, or prophet, king, and priest. Um, and so the family also exists as uh, prophet, king, and priest. Benedict XVI, in his first encyclical, uh, Deus Caritas Est, he kind of, um, he alludes to this as well, and when he says that the task of the church has always been the, the charisma, the preaching, uh, the liturgy, and service. So, uh, so what do we say here? Oh, one, minute, one, one thought before we go on. This is what the Baltimore Catechism taught. Um, it said that, uh, the, the question, why did God make me? God made me to know, love, and serve him and to, so I could be happy with him in heaven. So uh, to know it has to do with prophecy. To love has to be with the, the priesthood and to serve him is the royal function. So and for those of you that are uh, fans of the Baltimore Catechism. <clears throat> All right, so to be prophetic. Uh, to be prophetic is to be a witness to the communication of God. It's to evangelize and to catechize. So the family must be focused on uh, growing in the knowledge of God and his church and then sharing that knowledge with others. Um, this happens in many ways, um, but it's almost just kind of natural. Like if, if, the, if it's something is present, if the parents are doing something, kids automatically will just imitate it. I'm sure uh, for those of you that are parents, you've had the situation where you've done something and then you saw your, saw your child doing it and you're like, oh, shoot. I shouldn't have done that before in front of them. <clears throat> but um, one interesting thing that St. Paul VI, who was just canonized this past fall, he said this in his document on evangelization. He said, The family, like the church, ought to be a place where the gospel is transmitted and from which the gospel radiates. In a family which is conscious of this mission, all the members evangelize and are evangelized. The parents not only communicate the gospel to their children, but from their children, they can themselves receive the same gospel as deeply lived by them. And such a family becomes the evangelizer of many other families and of the neighborhood of which it forms part. So what we're seeing here, and what Paul VI has to say, is that it's not just the, a one-way thing where the parents are evangelizing the children. The children can then in turn evangelize the parents. Why? Because the task of evangelizing is, is given to us through our baptism. And so the child who is six months old, who is baptized, is an evangelizer. Now, one example that I can give in my own personal life, when my daughter was still very young, not even able to crawl yet, um, I had a, just a few moments where I looked at her and was just kind of overcome with that, that, that love for her that you can't really describe until you have a, your own kid. And all of a sudden it dawned on me that this feeling I feel for my daughter is the smallest drop in the smallest bucket of what God feels for me. Becoming a parent changed the way that I relate to God. And I appreciate what God has done for me in a more profound way than I had before. So my daughter, who was five months old, evangelized me. Now, was it like this conscious thing where she sat me down and said, you know, no. But through, through her, the, the grace of her baptism and through the relationship I had with her, she taught me something about God. So, um, in witnessing to one another, each family member uh, must also be devoted to learning and growing intellectually. Uh, you can't just um, be satisfied with... Uh, with um, your baby daughter. You gotta be kind of trying to grow in knowledge of, of what the church teaches, of what's in the scriptures. Um, and so, um, very practically, I preached the, the gospel to my kids the very first time I was able to hold them. I told them, you are created in the image and likeness of God. You are an heir to his kingdom. Our ancestors fell and you're born into sin, but Jesus came 
He's offered you the sacrament of baptism, which you'll receive in a few weeks. And he wants to pour his life into you and to transform you. They didn't know what they were hearing. But guess what? The first person that told them the gospel was their dad. That's my gift. That's my, um, that's my, it's not just a job. It's my, it's my, uh, what's the word? It's my privilege. So, that didn't just happen in one moment. It's got to be something that they, they get from us at all times. Even when they're 40 years old. As parents, we need to still be witnessing to them the gospel. You should be regularly turning to scriptures. You know, I was lucky to grow up in a family in which the scriptures were important. Now, we were a Catholic family, so we weren't getting chapter and verse, but it was more like, somewhere in the Bible, it says. <laughs> and so, but that was always, you know, whenever there was a question that came up or a discipline that needed to be given, there was a reference to somewhere in the Bible. There was a love for scripture, and so we need to cultivate that in our homes. Every family should have a copy of the catechism. I mean, it contains in a relatively small space everything we believe. It's invaluable. We need to have it in our homes. We need to be reading it regularly. Parents need to be involved in what their children are doing in their schools and in their religious education. And we need to be reading to our children the lives of the saints. The reason the church canonizes the saints is so that we have models to follow. So we need to be handing that on and giving it to them. Uh, finally, we are an age of Catholic content. You can fall down and run into a stack of Catholic books. Um, there's radio, television, movies, documentaries, magazines, newspapers, podcasts. I've heard of one that's mostly pretty good. Um, websites, YouTube videos. There's always something more to learn. You will not exhaust the possibilities. And if you do, Matthew Kelly's going to come out with another book. So. <laughs> um, so next, there is the role of uh, the king, all right? Jesus is king, but he is king in a very particular way. His kingship, his, his role of authority is always meant for the other. It's never self-serving. He is most royal on the cross when he's completely poured out on behalf of us, okay? So we're given this great treasure in our faith of the spiritual and corporal works of mercy, Give, hungry to the, give food to the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, comfort the afflicted, counsel the doubtful. Um, and, you know, if you're a good parent, you've probably been doing all these works of mercy. And if you've got small children, you've probably fed the hungry, gave drink to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, comforted the sorrow, and admonished the, the sinner probably within the first hour of the day. <laughs> what changes is whether or not it's an obligation because you don't want CPS to knock down your door, or uh, if it's love. And this is what John Paul II kind of points out in Familiaris Consortio. He says, another task for the family is to form persons in love, but also to practice love in all its relationships. And so we need to do the works of mercy in love and not just because of obligation. Um, and this is applicable whether or not you have small children or not. I mean, as long as you are around other people, the works of mercy are going to be, uh, uh, you know, central in your life. Um, but what, what changes is whether or not you're, do, you're performing those acts in love. Kind of a short aside here. I know I'm getting a little short on my time. But um, in, in Ephesians 5, Paul talks to um, husbands and wives. And he says that the, the husband is the head of his wife. This is what Paul's talking about, that to be head, to be in a, to be in a role of, um, of headship means that your whole life is poured out for the other person. It has nothing to do with you. And so as husbands, um, our job in our life is to put our wives first in every instance, um, to never think of ourselves first, to always put them number one, um, to get up on that cross and then she then in return um, answers that action and getting on the cross for us. But it's, as husbands, it's our, we, have to we have to make the first move because Jesus made the first move. And then the martyrs respond to Jesus in the giving of their lives. And so if the wife stands in the place of the church, she stands in place of the martyrs, so she also has to die. Um, but Jesus does it first, and the martyrs do it in response. So that being said, moving on to uh, priest. 
So, um, to be priestly is to be in dialogue with God. It's to be about the work of prayer and bringing the needs of yourself and others to God in prayer. And so, uh, to be priestly, the, the family needs to pray as the church prays. The church has her ritual prayer and she has her liturgical prayer. Um, and it's very important that she has both of those. Ritual prayer sometimes gets a bad rep of being kind of uh, dry and boring. But if it wasn't for ritual prayer, we couldn't pray together. And when the priest gets up on Sunday and says, the Lord be with you, and 300 people respond, and with your spirit, we can do that. We can pray as one body because of the ritual. That's what ritual gives us. And so um, it's really important for the, the, the family to have ritual prayers in which um, the child who can't even speak yet knows that we're praying right now and can enter into that even though they can't actually say the words. Um, uh, John Paul II points out that in Vatican Council II when it had a, a little section on the Liturgy of the Hours, one of the groups that were suggested to pray the Liturgy of the Hours was the family. And so why? Because it's this one more kind of ritual way of prayer that we can enter into. So just practical ways of being able to do ritual prayers, prayer before meals, uh, prayer uh, in the morning, prayer before bed, um, living the liturgical year, you know, if it's Advent, live Advent, don't celebrate Christmas too soon, if it's Christmas, live Christmas, don't put your Christmas tree out on the curb on December 26th, live it out, um, if it's Lent, celebrate Lent together, have a common practice of penance, for that the whole household is, is, is engaged in, um, not just uh, each individual doing their own thing. I mean, in the church, we all have a common penance. On Fridays, you can't eat meat, all right? Now, my parents tried to, like, no TV during Lent. That was a little too much, and we revolted, and the TV got turned back on. So <laughs> make sure you're, you're not trying to bite off more than you can chew all at once. But, um, but it's good for the whole family to take on common penance. Um, it allows them to enter in together. There's other things, you know, there's uh, epiphany door blessings. Um, uh, I guess I already said all these things. Uh, Advent wreaths, nativity, etc. Um, there's a book called Catholic All Year um, that has a lot of great ideas if you want to really kind of bring more of the liturgical year into your family. Um, consider the practice of having a family altar in your home. This is something that we just started doing. And... Um, you know, we put, you know, our rosaries up there, we put up our, you know, crucifix, uh, um, different devotional cards, holy cards, etc. And uh, it's a way of kind of having one central place that the family's prayer is centered around. It gives, again, this kind of, of, of focus. Um, and then it's really important for there to be Catholic art in the home. You know, uh, Blessed John Henry Newman, he talked about there's two different ways of, of knowing something, uh, uh, um, uh, notional assent and real assent. And he said notional assent is when somebody kind of gives you an argument and you follow along and, and then you're like, okay, yeah, I agree with that point. Real assent is like seeing the beauty in a church and having kind of your faith built up or um, seeing the beauty of nature and, and kind of learning to love creation. It, it goes more deeper. And so if art is present in your home, it's appealing to the re, uh, real ascent of, in, the, in your child and kind of strengthening their faith so that it's not just a notional thing in their head, but it's actually something that's deep within them. Um, and then finally, uh, the church also has private uh, devotions and spiritualities, novenas, patron saints. Um, celebrate the patient, uh, patron saints in, of your family. Um, Celebrate baptism days. Um, uh, the family rosary, John Paul II uh, makes a call for the family rosary. Uh, consecration of the sacred heart of Jesus, various forms of veneration of the Blessed Virgin Mary, etc. So there's this interplay of public and private prayer, and that appeals to both aspects of the human person in their, their individuality, but also in, their, in the community level. In conclusion, um, there was an interview that Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, who became Pope Benedict XVI, um, it, it, it was an interview he did in the 80s and it became a book. It was called The Ratzinger Report. Uh, he, said this, he said this, he said, what the church needs in order to respond to the needs of man in every age is holiness, not management. It's not coming up with the best 
program or the best approach. It's people need to be holy, and then the church can better appeal to the needs of man. Um, seeing as the family is the domestic church at the service of the needs of, of mankind, these are our marching orders uh, for the reform of the family. You know, often in my role as the director of family life for the diocese, people are like, you know, what do we do about the crisis of the family? You know, what, what's your big plan? Holiness. Like, that's the only plan we can really have, you know? So um, the holier you are, the holier those around you will be. Um, and this is something that uh, Dom Chattard uh, wrote in the book Spirit of the Liturgy. He talked about the principle that spiritual generation, whoever the kind of you influence, is, will always be one degree less than you are at. So if you're pious, well, then you're, you're, those who are influenced by you will be, uh, they'll be decent. If you're just decent, they'll be heathens. Uh, so we have to be saints. So thank you. Any questions?